you see on my screen, training.playwithdocker.com, if you hit this site, it will give you a session in the browser to play around with the Docker things. So without installing Docker on your machine, you can run Docker stuff within the browser. So this is kind of a set of tutorials which is there by Docker company itself. They provide this one. Uh, you can follow this tutorial and give you the command over here. And then if you need another like enhanced version of this, uh, there is something called labs.playwithdocker.com. So if you hit this URL, uh, the first time you hit, it will ask for username and password, which will be your Docker ID, which is something what we use to log into hub.docker.com or the page which I showed you, events.docker.com. So once you create your Docker ID, it will be can be used around in most of the environments within Docker. Uh, it runs, but you have to do extra bit of work to make it happen. Uh, there's something called Docker Toolbox. So it's like so what you will see on Windows 10, it does all the hard work for you at the behind when you <coughs> just install Docker for Windows in one day. The installer does all the work for you. So the Docker toolbox and the Windows 7 kernel is not so advanced to work with the container technology. So when you install on Docker, Docker on Windows 7, you have a Docker toolbox, which is like a separate component of things installed one by one. And then when you have it all manually, yeah. So better, I would say, shift to Windows 10 mm -hmm. and use on Windows 10. You have you would get two advantages. One is better experience <coughs> working with it, and you would get Windows container or two with it on Windows 10. On Windows 7, it won't work. So make a note of this tool, labs.playwithdocker.com and training.play. <coughs> so to continue with the same thing, uh, let me show you some Docker commands. Okay, nothing specific to Django. It's all Docker related things. So when I added that environment variable Python buffer equal to one, the reason was that I should see the logs happening on my terminal. So there is a command called Docker logs. So Docker PS gives you a list of containers running on your system and I want to see the logs for this container. So each container has a specific ID and if you do Docker logs, the container ID, it would spit out the logs for you on the terminal. And if I add some extra parameter dash dash follow in it, so it will keep the session attached with it. So you, it's like doing the tail command on Linux. You can see what's happening. So if I hit, localhost 8000 slash admin, So when I started the Django project, it said we have 15 unapplied migrations. So let's do that first. How to clear this out error? Sorry. So 
By default, Django gives uh, a web interface where it has a local user management console. So there are certain tables created for you. So by default, when you start Django app, it talks to an uh, in-memory database, which is SQLite. So if you see on my system view, there is a DB SQLite 3 file created, which is a database related file. So it does all the backend work, creating the table structure, the schema, and everything. Django does it for you. And it says those has not been persisted into the database. So that's saying, please apply these migrations before you keep starting. Yeah. So this is kind of so let's say in your application you develop a table which is called uh, user info or something, a specific schema what you develop. And you need that to be applied. So that's where you write your class for that specific in Django. And Django would generate the table structure or the schema for you by default. You don't have to go and write the create table, whatever definition is there. Django does that work for you. So that's the advantage. So then this Django interface is this class or No, it's, it's kind of a different framework. It, you get a choice of what you need to use. So by default, when you run, it runs in an in-memory database, which is called SQLite. And that's what you see over here. <coughs> So let me get rid of this error and there are two ways of doing it. I can either go into the container or I can attach to the executing container and execute that command. So I will show you how to attach to that container again. So to clear this error, uh, there is this command, python manage.py migrate. So it will do all the migration for you. And how I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to use a docker execute command, something similar to docker run. But instead of spinning up a new container, what it will do is that attach a session to my executing container right now. <coughs> so on my host, I have a container with ID, this one. So let me copy that ID and I will replace it to a here. So my command is docker exec minus ip attach a terminal and execute the command by <coughs> demo manage.py migrate. So it's basically something similar what you saw over here. So rather than doing it on my local host or going into the container and doing I doing it from outside the container, executing a command, passing a command into it. So that is docker exec. So when I did that, it created all schema and the required files or the structure for me. So by default, uh, Django gives you user administration page. So you don't have to go and build the user management page again.
So on your local host 8000 and if you hit slash admin, you get a page which is called Tango Administration. And I did something a bit thin, I don't know why. So I have my app basic structure running. I have applied my migrations and everything. Uh, let's do something similar like this one. So I need to add a feature into my application. So in Python or in Django, they say it as a module, I think so. Or the app. So here they are referring it as post. So let's follow the same thing. So for that, I need to create this, execute this command again. So let's execute it from the outside. So when I did execute that command, uh, it created an extra folder for me, posts. And if I go, So my, when I created that, executed that command, uh, Python, this one, start as post, it should again create some uh, basic folder structure for me. So that's test whether that is there or not. And if you see, it's something similar what is there on the page. Okay. And that's the same folder what you see within the container also. Perfect. So now you need to create your first view, which is under course views.py. So what I did is that uh, I created my first view, which is something similar over here. What do you see? And when you created your view to access that 
page, you need to define that how you would access in that page on the Django application. So you need to define those things in urls.py. So the first thing is you created a view which was called views.py, which is by default created for you. And views is the page where you would go and define whatever the front end what you need in your application. And models.py would be where you would define your database related classes. So let's say I need to add a new table into the database which is called uh, user info or something. So I def would define a class something over here, Python class, which would say there is a need to create a table with the same class name. So that's how Django would create the database structure for you. So within your class, you will define what are the fields required. Okay? I'm not going to in, would be going into that piece. I will just show you how to add a view within that Django. So in my post directory, you will see there is no file called urls.py. <coughs> okay? So that's a file which you need to create it. So let's add that file and say urls.py. So what I'm saying is uh, at the root of the, my application, uh, I'm adding a view called index which I added in over here. If you see, there is a method called index. So when the app, Django app runs, it goes looking for a file called index or a definition, method definition called index. So my index is in a file called views.index. So views is the file name over here. And within that file, there is a method called index. So that's the reason I mentioned something similar over here. Okay, so that's how the mapping would work. So what you have defined right now is just within this post directory. <coughs> My root of the project doesn't know <coughs> there is a view, new view being added. So I need to uh, highlight them also, or my root project also, there is a new view has been added. So what I would do is that go into demo and demo has already a urls.py. So when you launch your Django app, all the reference what you give on a URL would be coming from this file what you are seeing. So whenever you create a new app within Django and you add a new view, you should add an entry over here also. So that my root of the application because my manage.py will look for this file only. It is not aware of anything this one. So what I'm saying is that under the path polls, include polls.url also. So when my Django app starts up, it will include <coughs> this file also, which has an entry to the views.index. This post is like a sub, like a sub, uh, sub directory in your project structure. So, so say I had to add a new feature into my application, I would start a new module or an app within the Django and create it in a directory. So within that yes. yes. <coughs> so keeping your code clean helps you to keep your code clean. Some modules. So this include statement what you see has to be referenced from a Python class. So I'm including a import statement for this also. 
So from Django.urls, which is a library available for you, there is a method defined called include, so I'm including those things because I'm referencing it over here. So I did all my code which is there on my local system. Okay. So this is my root of the project, which I initially created. Uh, Post is what something new feature I added into Django. And in Post, I added a file called urls.py, which has entrance to my entry to my new view, which is got created. But my whole main application doesn't know that has been added. So to make my application aware, I am adding this statement. So the flow starts. So the flow initial <coughs> flow starts from here. URLs.py. First, I create views.py, which says whenever some request called index is created, uh, give a HTTP response called hello Docker Panic. Okay. So you added this new feature as a separate application within your Django. My root of Django doesn't know I have added this. So to make it aware, what I will say is that first I will add the entry in my urls.py, create a new file. Uh, then I will say to my root of the project, say that I have a new entry and which has to be, you have to take care. So whenever a request something called polls come in, please redirect that by including this one. So it will go and look for polls dot urls which is this file and it will say i need to serve a response call request call index so it will go and look for views dot index which is this one and it will give you this response so that's how the flow would work So you're being at
So we will do some live debate. Yeah. So let's see what there is. So there are is at stake. I'm not going to accept any individual here. There is settings.py and we want to inform you uh, the Django app that I have installed a new app which is something like this. So, uh, if you see on my screen, it says no module name codes. Uh, the reason the error was there because when Django loads the application, when you run execute um, manage.py <coughs> run server, the first it looks for all the settings from this file settings.py. And my there is a section called installed apps. So you need to inform your application loader that these are the four uh, applications what you need to load while starting up. So I added a definition called foods.apps. So if you look into my polls directory, there is an apps.py and it has some polls config which says load my application configuration from this one called polls. So you need to make them aware of it. <laughs> so 
that should be zero. So I add it over here. Other than that, I don't see a reference somewhere. Start from uh, I created this pose views. So my views is over here. Then we let's keep it as Perfect.
screen uh, I hit slash quotes and you see hello drop up an egg. So let me show you what mistake I made earlier. So my post directory which I got created, the module or app which I created was one level outside rather than being in. So I was referring to a different directory. So over here I'm referring post.urls, which means uh, my URLs file is over here, and it would look into the same directory structure because my manage.py is at this level. So all my directories should be at the same level when it's referencing. So nothing other than that new. And if you see when I hit slash posts. So how that flow would work is that uh, it would come to the demo urls.py slash polls and it would look reference polls.urls. So then it would go to this one urls.py and there is a new defined name as index. So any request slash polls, right now it's only uh, what request over here, the path is. So if you have many pages, web pages to be showed, you would list everything over here and define a particular method for that. So I have only one method called index, which I have defined in my views, which is over here. So the request comes over here and it gives a response, hello, Dr. Panay, which is the web page. 
that's how the whole flow works. Okay. So now questions. Because that's uh, what I had. I have like in the list on the agenda. If you see on the meetup, uh, there is a Docker Swarm and Docker registry thing. Are you interested to listen to that? Because uh, next month there is a workshop which is going to be covered during the same topics, which will be a hands on live session. So I can talk about uh, registry and Docker Swarm, just give you a brief introduction what it is, and maybe the next month or in October we'll do hands on live session. So do you want to do some lab or? Like I go and show you what it is. Okay, okay, okay. This is much easier. Yep. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. So, like, uh, just to give you a brief introduction, what registry is? Uh, if you see my Docker file over here, from Python Alpine, when I see. It's going and pulling some images for me from the internet. So that is a place on the internet which is called Docker Hub and it's a Docker registry which has been provided by Docker company itself. But he as a developer or say I'm running a company, I don't want my code to be shared with the internet. I want to keep it something private behind my firewall. So I need to run a registry within my organization. So how would you do that? So if you go and search on hub.docker.com, So there is a Docker image available for the registry itself. So you don't have to go and set up everything for it. So all you need to do is pull down this registry image, which would give you a registry instance. So you can save your Docker images within this one. So rather than going and saving your images on Docker Hub, you can save something within your firewall by running this method. Uh, to show you that, <coughs> so whatever I'm talking about, it's all available on docs.docker.com. So after the session, if you need to know more things about it, visit this page, docs.docker.com. Without giving an error. 
So that's the disadvantage of using the open source registry Docker image. You don't get any nice GUI feature to interact with it. You need to do all the work to make that nice web application working for you. So if I hit hub.docker.com, you see a nice interface where I can go and search, uh, look for different images. But if you run something locally on your system, you are not going to get a good <coughs> interface. Because the registry container which got spinned up, it's running on your system but only serving to REST APIs. So if I hit localhost slash e2 slash underscore catalog. So if you hit that endpoint slash catalog, it shows what images are available within my registry. So repositories, curly brace, nothing inside. So that means in my local registry, I don't have any Docker images. Okay. Doubts? No. Clear. Registry. That is it. So, you say, you say an image which I need to consume. Give me an image named Docker image which you know or wish you could have on your system. Any name? Nginx. Nginx. Okay. Docker Pool. Nginx. Luckily, I have Nginx on my machine. I think so. Yes. So I had already my Docker uh, Nginx image. So let's see how the Nginx image looks like. Uh, Docker run. Minus E and the next. So I'm doing something different. So in the earlier Docker commands, when I said Docker run, I used a small P. Here I'm using a capital P. So there is a difference between that. So when I use a small P, I'm saying I, I need to explicitly pass the port what I need to buy within the container. But when I pass minus P as a capital, capital P, big P, the Docker does that uh, port binding for me. So if I do Docker PS now, I see three containers running on my system. And one is the Nginx. And if you see this one, the port binding 32768 to 80 within the container is done by Docker rather than me doing stuff. So it did the work for me. So that's the difference. If you pass minus E as small, you need to pass the port which you need to find. And if you pass it as capital P, it does all the work for you. It assigns a random port and binds it into the container. So if I do Local host got it. So I got an Nginx container running on my machine without doing any installation. Full feature of Docker. Now this Nginx image which I use, say I customize it, but I don't want to share it with the community the internet. So what I will do is that uh, docker tag nginx local host colon 5000 slash nginx. So there is a reason for doing that. So when you put the docker image from docker hub, you didn't specify where to look for. Because when you do the installation of Docker, it knows where to go and look for the Docker image by default. 
which is the Docker call. So that has been configured on your system. <coughs> but when you consume an image within your registry firewall, you need to specify the Docker daemon that when is my registry running. So in my case, my registry is running on local host 5000. Okay? Which is the container I spinned up. And I am uploading an image called Nginx. So I am tagging my existing image on my local box with that name. So that's a kind of a pattern you need to follow if you are not working with Docker Cloud. Okay? So on my box, if you see, I have a list of Nginx images, which are this one. And so this is the latest image which I tagged, and I need to upload it onto my registry. So I would do a Docker push. So now what it's doing is that uploading that image onto my private registry, which is running on my local box right now. If I refresh that same URL, v2 underscore catalog, now I see repositories and the next, which is that the image which you pull from internet docker hub, you tag it as a local host column by token slash and and hit a docker push, so that push the docker image onto my local registry, and that's where you can go and list what images are available on my private docker registry. Okay? something let me show you how this works <coughs> so I'm going into the container which runs my registry and you see there is a nice file system available for me So any registry which is which you need to work on with, it has a minimal configuration to keep it running. So when I spin my registry instance, it's by default loading this configuration for me. And if you see, I can show you within the container how it looks. So that Nginx image which I uploaded, if you need to see the physical location where it is stored. So within my container, if you see, uh, there is a folder at this part, var with registry docker repositories. And if you see a folder called Nginx. Uh, 
So each image you upload, it will have this kind of directory structure within the registry. So if I shut down this container right now, everything is stored within the container. So the image you uploaded and everything would be gone. So make sure that this directory, what you see, wireless registry, is mounted onto your file system so that the images what you upload get saved somewhere. So that's how you would uh, mount that directory over here. So on your local system, you would create a directory slash mng registry and mount it into wireless registry. So any uploads you are doing on your local system, uh, you would have a local copy of it on your file system. Uh, then is a full configuration. So this is the basic configuration. So you can store your images on Amazon, Google Cloud or Azure something. So if you go and look for, let me show you how that full configuration looks like. <coughs> so this is a configuration by default, not by default, you need to customize it. Uh, so it shows how the logs would be shared, created and saved in the system. Uh, it has a section of storage, uh, how the file system, where my default images would be uploaded. So it will be wireless registry, which I showed you in the container over here. Wireless registry. And say, you need to mount this as a storage on a cloud, which is Azure, Google Cloud, or S3, which is Amazon, Google, Azure. You can specify whatever things is required by that cloud service over here. And then you can put on the authentication, like when I hit hub.docker.com, it asks for my username and password, which is my Docker ID. So there is a password authentication mechanism before it. If you hit my registry, which is running on this one, there is no authentication, anyone can go and pull and push images onto this. So you can put your own authentication mechanism. So all that configuration goes into a file called config.yml file, which you will create here. So that's the basic thing for registry. Just go and hit docs.docker.com and go for search for Docker registry. It will give you a complete documentation about how to work with it. So I showed you how to start with it. Go and look around with how things looks within a Docker container running registry for you. Okay? Yes. Have to go to the website or just the layout. Just just say it as docs.docker.com. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so that's what I had for today. Uh, I will not be speaking about Docker Swarm. Next month, I will give you a hands-on lab session how to work with it. Because what I show right now will be on my machine and you won't have an instance to play around with it. So maybe next month, we'll have a set of tutorials which we'll go through and do a hands-on lab session. So any questions for me? So two more times. Two more times. Today or okay. next one? Today. Today it was supposed to be until two. We are early by one hour. If you have questions, you can stay around. There are no questions. Have questions. So all of you have any questions. Yeah. To go to the page or to go to in our computer system, right? That's right. You need to type docs dot docker dot com. Docker dot com. Docker. Yeah, yeah, what is it? Okay.
So what was your second part of the question? In the database, you want So I create a volume 
in my Docker Compose, I'm seeing uh, volume Postgres data. Okay. Create. What do you mean? Create a volume. So volume is kind of a drive what I attach if I take a USB drive attach you to my local box. I'm getting an extra space on my system. Okay? Would so, it be different from SP? Yeah, it's a different concept. Volume, the terminology remains the same. But when you create this one, Docker is doing the stuff for you. So when I be pass minus B and give a folder name, you are saving all the data as a local file system within the container. And when you do attach a volume something like this, it's keeping outside of the container for you. Is there a volume if you have to store the name of the Docker? So that's what I'm saying. The volume terminology remains the same when you are doing minus V folder thing and this extra volume, uh, external volume. Because at the end, it's a file system created for you on the, your box. One is inside the container and this one, so you need to understand what's the difference between them. So when I say this one, all the data which is generated by the container is stored outside of the container for you as a separate hard disk kind of thing. Okay, and then you are seeing mount that. So that Docker run command is good when you need to work with single container. Now in this case, I have multiple containers. Docker. So I use Docker Compose, which is kind of a thing. You say these are set of the containers which I need to speed up and you do all the hard work for me. I'm not going to execute Docker run command. So when you Docker compose up what we should, Docker is doing some hard work for you behind. Because say I need to run this as a two separate container on my system. I would go and make sure first database comes up. So I'm explaining you when you run it as a separate thing container, individual containers. So Docker run post space, it comes up. On a second terminal, you do Docker compose my app, Django app. Then two containers are up for you. But my Django app doesn't know how to connect it. Okay, so because if I had not specified uh, the ports and everything, my app wouldn't know how to go and connect to it. So now when you spin up individual containers, they are on different networks. They don't know how to talk to each other. You need to make those things happen, which is an extra work for you. So when you do all those stuff in the Docker Compose, Docker does that work for you. I think there's a connection between database so, and yeah. the network. So when you make it as a service, each service, becomes as a container which is accessible by that name. So when I hit from this container HTTP DB, it knows how to resolve it. Because at the back, <coughs> Docker creates a DNS entry for you, which is internal to Docker, not known to you. So these two services know how to talk to each other. If DB refers Django, HTTP column Django, it will know how to resolve that because <coughs> Docker does the DNS entry for by each service name. So it knows how to resolve the DNA. And that is because there is a networking topology laid out for you by Docker itself, rather than you doing the networking stuff. Okay? And <coughs> this one, once that goes down, it's still there persisted outside volume because it's not, this is within the container. So the only difference is when I did docker run minus v, I was specifying it which directory to use. In this case, it will create a volume something over here in my drive as a separate storage and the data will be there. Yeah, so they create a disk, a new, a new Yeah, assume it has a disk which is 
activated or yeah. But actually, it's not a okay. And if you need to list what volumes are available, the command is Dr. Volume LS. So this is the statement what you are looking for. So, okay, based on this screen, does it mean that uh, when the Docker runs through the Docker Compose, it will first generate, it will first go to the volume, generate a new volume called Postgres dash data, and then they will go for service. Let, let, us, let us see how it goes. Okay. Let me copy. So I have ever So in my, I am in this folder, and in that folder I have a Docker Compose file. So I will do Docker. Let me once more check it. So I'm saying use the image Postgres and build from this one. in the same order, but it doesn't guarantee you that my database server will be up and ready to serve your app. So you need to take care of that part. In this, it's a small application, it works fine, you don't see any problem. So, ignore this one, uh, this is some advanced stuff. So if you see the statement, this all things, it did for you. So it's laid down on network called my Python MY default. Because I am in the current directory which is called Python MY. So it's creating by that name. So Docker Compose uses the same uh, thing. Like when you execute a Docker Compose up command, it will by default, name all the resources which is required by the current folder what you are in. So I am in Python and my folder, and it's creating a network called this thing. 
So it will lay down a network for those network settings. It's creating volume. Because I had a volume in my specification Dr. Compose file, it created that volume for me. Uh, creating Python Django db one and so it created <coughs> those services. So up until this step, all the work which you did by manually Docker run command was taken care of you by Docker user, the mm -hmm. Docker engine. showed in the web interface MySQL there is a web application developed for it I don't have it on my machine and I don't have a Postgres instance installed on my machine so that I can connect to it but if you see there is a container running That you will see what of ports are open on my machine right now. <coughs> Trust me, it's working somewhere. Okay. I don't have. Uh, okay, for Dr. Compose. Let's say uh, we shut down the Dr. Compose right now. We will release all the data from the volume post grade data. So one way of doing is control C over here, or what I would do is that uh, go into the same Minus V. If you do a Docker 
compose down, it's going to save your data everything within that volume. So next time you do Docker compose up, it will use the same volume, which will have the same data. But if you pass Docker compose down minus B, to remove named volumes declared in the volume section. So if you look my Docker compose file. I have a volume defined as post this data. And if I do docker compose down minus b, it will delete that volume from my system. So let's say docker volume ls. You see there is a post this data volume created. It was the uh, it was the post generated by the docker compose. Yes. So it's still there on my system. I did a docker compose down, it's not destroyed. So let's do docker compose up again. You connect this. So it will use the same volume again. So which means if your application wrote some data into that volume, it will be available. Uh, but if I do uh, docker compose. So which means access the data in the volume. So you can't go and directly access that volume which was created. You would have to mount that and give it to the Postgres container. Exactly, you don't want to go through any access. Let's say I'm on Windows system and I want to access that volume. Yes. So uh, the volumes can be accessed. I'm not saying no, but I want to recommend you go and deal with the database file system, okay? There are ways to do it. So the first way is like my container is attaching to a volume which is created by Docker itself. So Docker doesn't give you direct access to that volume. You go and manually touch it. Because if you do something, then the next time app won't come up. Something bad if you do. So that volume will be kind of corrupted. Now the Docker volume, uh, now so that Docker volume store the data from Postgres. Yeah. Let's say I want to have a post to our local PC so that I can visualize the Postgres data. Is, is, that, uh, is it possible? It's possible. So I have done, my experience is only at a code level. I have never dealt with a database file system going and viewing it, how it looks like. I don't, I won't advise you to do it because it would, the data would be stored in a binary thing it won't be directly readable to you, first thing. And if you're trying to mess around with, like if you take a copy and do a cross threading and everything, that's okay. But I won't recommend you to blow and uh, lie and stuff like this. Okay? I'm not saying it's not possible, it's done. That volume which got created uh, is there on your file system. Yeah, that's there on our file system. Yeah. Even though Docker Compose is down, the box is still there. Yes. Let's say that it's for your point. Get it out. Yeah, you, it's possible. Uh, I don't know a way to do it right now. Maybe next time I will do it. Because that uh, volume which I showed you, Docker Volume LS, yeah, it's there on your file system, but it's in a virtual machine which is running on my Mac. I need to get into that virtual machine, get that data out. Okay? It's kind of difficult for me to show you right now, but it's there for you to do a backup or go through it. So now I'm doing Docker Compose down minus B. So now if I go and do docker volume ls, you don't see this volume, which is missing. Okay, so there's a difference between minus v and without v. Okay.
more questions we have like half an hour now or you want to that So that is a body, which is a doctor stuff, which is created as a vacuum body. So what kind of data are you storing in? What is your requirement? So if it's a simple file system, like a code which you're generating for your application, you can pull it out, you give it a drop and then you get whatever you want. If it's a database related things, you just store the data. Now it's in a safe for my age. If you want to manage and figure if the data is in the right, in every proportion that you are doing that is right. So when you say manage my data, it would first depend what kind of data you want. So, uh, just a request from me, if you have a laptop right now, hit that URL, you can start Docker.com. Can you please sign up for me over there? Because the next month when I do a meetup, I have to show that, yes, I have interested candidate who is willing to come up and attend the workshop. So that would help me to talk to Docker you can use my laptop. Come. So he is demoing how to get registered. If you have a doubt, he is demoing how to get registered to events.com.